You're breaking up with us? Who the hell do you think you are, lady? You can't just go around breaking people's hearts like that. I fell in love with you. We fell in love with you. Guys, I guess just don't follow the fucking sky, you know? Beautiful, naked, big titty women just don't follow the sky, you know? feeling you get when the lights <laughs> begin to dim and we go somewhere we've never been before not just entertained but somehow we belong together dazzling images on a huge silver screen sound that I can feel somehow hot break feels good in a place like this yeah I uh, okay. it just Let me hit a big old rape. Not rape. Jesus Christ. Vape. What's pen. wrong with you? I, I, I know, dude. I've been watching Mad Men. I don't know. Hold on. There's rape in Mad Men? Oh, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I don't know how you people do this. All right. Hello. And welcome back to Artur Aristocra. My name is Harvey Pizza. I'm brought to you tonight by my co-host, Mr. Declan Powers, for a remake of our original demo of our first episode, an episode so golden that the FBI and the CIA had to uh, cut it and steal our audio and make sure it was monitored by everyone of the Hollywood Foreign Press. Declan, how are you feeling tonight, my friend? I'm good. I mean, that's good. Now, tell the folks where you are, because I know you're walking the streets or something. What's going on? I am outside of AMC theaters where I work, and uh, I'm, like, smoking right on Third Street Promenade, and it's very, very loud. And there's a lot of deranged homeless people walking around, so you might hear some of that during our demo. But I don't give a fuck. All right. Some deranged homeless people. Maybe we can bring them on sometime in the future and ask them their favorite movies. Oh God! But I the, have, the whole I have thing the entire, is. I have the. I have the entire. Uh, well, have you been to AMC theaters recently? Uh no, I have not. So they have. Um, and SNL did a parody of it. They did a. Uh, they, the Nicole had Kidman ad. thing. Yeah, they've had the Nicole Kidman ad. For like a couple of years now and I've seen it so many times that I have the entire thing memorized oh, I'm like yeah? verbatim I can do the whole thing okay if you, okay, want, right I can, if you want I can do it right now all okay right? now hold on I'll give you the intro ladies and gentlemen on a tour aristocrat we not only embrace the beauty of cinema we we, we don't just recant all of time of film you know, we can go back and quote Billy Wilder, David Lynch movies till we're blue and red and black in the face. Tonight, Declan Powers, a man that works for AMC and AMC Theaters, will be reciting the entire commercial that Nicole Kidman did that scares the shit out of me. Declan, take it away, Stepford Wife. We come to this place for magic. We come to AMC Theaters <laughs> to laugh, to cry, <laughs> to care. Because we need that, all of us. That indescribable feeling you get when the lights begin to dim and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn together. Dazzling images on a huge silver screen, sound that I can feel. Somehow, hot break feels good in a place like this. Our heroes feel like the best part of us, and the stories feel perfect and powerful. Because here... They are. 
DMT theaters. <laughs> we make movies better. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the and that, oh, oh, is set oh, on all sides. Okay. Okay. The okay. 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 All right. Okay. Let's dial I'm it down, done. Ezekiel. Let's dial Dude, it down. We already got a golden moment, and make almost makes up. For losing the original demo episode. Declan, holy shit, dude. That was better than Tom Cruise's performance in Eyes Wide Shut, at least. I knew you were going to reference third. Eyes Wide Shut. You, what do you love about that? Because I've never seen it. What do I love about Eyes Wide Shut? Yeah. Uh, I mean, besides the mystery surrounding the fact that there's 40 minutes that was cut before it was released, and, you know, Kubrick was meticulous up until the last night, of editing, you know, about getting it distributed. What do I love about the movie? I am a very, very, very big fan of the chemistry that's not exactly there between real-life couple Tom and Nicole. I love the music. is beautiful, creepy at times. Everyone always talks about the orgy scene, which, yes, great. Big old tits, some dudes dancing naked in a mask. Like, lots of good stuff. People fucking... A lot of fucking. The joke said, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dennis something. Dennis Miller, babe, said about it one time was that Kubrick was spanking to the dailies of Eyes Wide Shut, which I understand. But it's a movie for me that the same way Twin Peaks The Return uses The Wizard of Oz to tell the Laura Palmer story and invites everybody to go through this whirlwind trip of, oh, and we're coming back to reality. Eyes Wide Shut is a movie that not only quite literally um, showcases Clinton-era like debauchery and degeneracy while everyone shows a bright face and acts as if they really care about kids being killed in Columbine. It's a movie that, from the opening, it's his most hypnotic dream. And I put it above The oh, Shining. Wow. Okay. I love The Shining, but it, to me, is an overrated film. Without Nicholson, the picture doesn't work at all. And I think Kubrick even knew that going in. But why I love Eyes Wide Shut, give it that 9 out of 10. Uh, for as long as it is, every single performance is amazing. Alan Cumming, for the two to three minutes that he's in, you know, being the openly bisexual guy, and he even said off screen, like, oh, you know, people always said about Tom Cruise that he was gay. I didn't get that at all. Is the whole thing that Kubrick is in, embodying to me is American values the face of American values, and then what people hide behind, the masks of, you know, orgy fucking, child rape, killing people saying that they died of heroin overdoses when really, you know, Epstein Island officiators were like, kill that cunt, she's going to tell people stuff. And for that guy to make this movie, and, you know, oh, he dies out of nowhere. The mystery is granted, and we can talk about it till the end of time. But I, I love the movie because it's a trip it's dreamlike, and for a lot of films that discuss sexuality, sensuality, the mood, the tonal atmosphere, and the fact that he recreated New York City blocks almost verbatim in the UK because he didn't want to go back to America, uh, I love it. And it shows the power of what a filmmaker can do at like a Paul Thomas Anderson level that he is now. Like that guy can do anything, any project, and even bring Daniel Day Lewis out of retirement again did the film and uh dude you should see eyes wide shut i'm surprised you haven't seen it and then just a fun fact did you know originally steve martin was the guy that kubrick wanted instead of tom cruise really okay yeah dude, i didn't how know fucking that. rat that would have been how, weird that's the thing is like it would have been the best thing ever and it would have changed the whole career trajectory of what martin was doing he did this movie years ago called pennies from heaven which is one of my favorite movies ever Ernanette Peters, Bob Hoskins, and him. It's a musical. It's got murder, mafioso stuff. It's great. Detective, gangster picture. But he chose, I believe, to do that film, or Kubrick saw that film to try and get him to do this adaptation of Traumaville. And, uh, you know, you know, Steve was like, fuck, man. Like, I, I'm going to have to say no. Because he, I, I don't think he had the confidence yet. And what's funny okay. is that, like, uh, I don't know, every time I watch it, in the same way that people say The Shining, there's something new, there's something different. Like, oh, you pick up on this here. Oh, my God, Jack Nicholson's really breaking the fourth wall with his eyes throughout the film. I never noticed this. Dude, Eyes Wide Shut is a movie that you could watch a hundred times over and still have different expectations as to how the movie ends. And I, 
I I can't wait till we actually talk about it because it's a great film. Cool. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Uh, What's your favorite Kubrick is The Shining? My favorite? No, I don't like The Shining at all. Hit me. Tell me uh, your favorite and tell me why you don't like Shining. Well, my favorite Kubrick film is uh, A Clockwork Orange. And I heard something from Tarantino that made me really angry. Okay. We'll put Quentin on the line. His, like, okay, man, you know, like, okay. That's my best. That's my best shot. At you want me to do it? I'll do it. Sure. Okay. Now the film. All right. Like it's a film. It's not a movie. Okay. It's not a TV movie. All right. It's not a movie on TV. All right. <gasps> oh. Now, now the thing. What makes it so good? You know. It's like it's it's, it's a clockwork orange. You know. Like like what does that mean? You know. Like 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 is, is it two volumes? Is, is there a grapefruit tabernacle? Like like what does that mean? That was that's the best I got right now. Oh, all right. I should have added in a couple. Of, okay. All right. <laughs> But yeah, there was anyway. uh, there was a bit that Norm Macdonald did where he pretended to be uh, Clinton for Howard Stern. He's like, I just I just pull thoughts out of my oddly misshapen head, okay? Yeah, I'm like I'm fucking I've seen dying. It. Yeah, Dude, anyway, Norm's a legend. My favorite my favorite Kubrick film is A Clockwork Orange because of the ambiguity of the ending that I think a lot of people don't talk about, which is was uh it's Alex DeLarge is his name, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh great character name, by the way. Um mm-hmm. I did it, I named him. If oh you did. Okay. That was me. I wrote the book. <laughs> um is the ambiguity of the ending. You don't know for certain whether or not Alex has actually been rehabilitated. And then on top of that even if he has been re- rehabilitated, he's been rehabilitated by this this awful authoritarian government where it's like, mm-hmm. is it actually better for society that he's quote-unquote rehabilitated? Yep. And uh, I love that about, about the film. Um, the Shining, I just feel like it's a bunch of shit happening and nothing means anything, and it just Ooh. drives me nuts. See, that's... That's I disagree with it means nothing. That film is him at his most like next to the final cut of Eyes Wide Shut, which we'll never see. That dude says a lot about like, hey, I faked the moon landing. Hey, people are going to use racial hatred and instill it forever, but there will always be this seedy underbelly that controls everything in this Monopoly board of America. Hey, Scatman Carruthers is here. Hey, remember in Cuckoo's Nest when Scatman Carruthers was in the mental ward and bonding with Jack Nicholson? But now in this movie, Jack Nicholson is like, I'm going to kill the black fella. There's there's a lot, but you're right. It is all over the place for the sake of what the fuckery. And that's, you know, to me, it's one of those first movies that ever did that. But no, you're right. I, in Clockwork Orange, dude, I have it on VHS. <laughs> My X-rated copy right next to Full Metal Jacket and Last Tango in Paris, which we will be discussing in the non-demo episode. But, dude, <sighs> Clockwork Orange, it's a movie that, to me, like, atmospherically, the bond that he has with the rival gang guy was like, you globinous glip of chip oil. There's so much that I I love atmospherically that makes that movie seem like its own universe. And where it gets really uncomfortable at points, um, almost, you know, the idea where even Malcolm McDowell on the set is like, you know, Stanley, I think I should sing Gene Kelly here. And Stanley's like, that's fucking great. I'm a loon. Do it. Like, it, it, it is a better film on multiple, multiple levels. And then the other thing, talking, you know, uh, Christian with a heart of gold over here and my boy that doesn't believe but is open to stuff and loves Magnolia for some reason. That movie does the best job of orchestrating the re- what you're talking about, the end with Alex DeLarge, the redemption of mental health and therapy and equating it to religion, equating it to Jesus, which I love when he's in jail and the guy's like, you know, son, the only way to get out of here is through the Lord. And so he gets the uh, the approval and the idea is that, you know, how can one ever be redeemed? And then the last line, of course, is, oh, 
I was cured, all right. And that final shot of him being lowered into what I assume is a grave while he's fucking that woman, they're laughing like crazy. I think it's to show all these people that are watching them being lowered down to death that know there's degeneracy, there's not a certain way to live, you know, fucking like rabbits is the way to go, but they're all dressed, clapping like they're couples and enjoying the show, saluting that they're whoever Alex is with in that moment with the beautiful tits. You know, there's there's something to him embracing the wild side and moving forward, which in a Don Draper Mad Men sense, you know, you're not an alcoholic. You're someone that had a drinking problem and move forward. Um, the other thing, too, because I know we always talk trans stuff. We're all, we're big LGBTQ and on, but in a David Bowie, non-Nazi ideology sense. The score by Wendy Carlos is fucking amazing, and it makes um, Ludwig van Beethoven's music almost better with its glitchy, creepy synth sounds. and It's haunting, you know, that atmosphere. I can hear the... In my head right now. We were um, in our demo that we lost. One of the things that we were talking about was the fact that I didn't, um, I didn't like uh, Todd Phillips' Joker movie. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very like shallow and pedestrian. Not to sound like a philosophical cunt, but you know, we did name our podcast. What was it? Uh, two, hey, hey, two, two, I, didn't, right, I, right I decided the name is okay. And, you know, we're both philosophical. Yeah, I, okay, I came here, up with it, but, but do it again. Go ahead. Just say the thing, my brother. A, a tour aristocrat. Yes. Or yes. aristocrat, if you will. Um, um, yeah, uh, I, I didn't like the first Joker. Uh, I thought it was very shallow. But I am very excited for Joker. Play adieu with uh, Lady Gaga. And we were talking about the idea that um, they modeled Lady Gaga's uh, makeup off of Courtney Love because she has the the black diamond eyes um, with like, I guess, mascara tears running down or whatever. And it felt very... And then also like for trivia, so Batman and Robin bombed at the box office. And it was like the final nail in the Joel Schumacher coffin. Batman Forever actually did pretty well. Um, yeah, Jim Carrey. A, there, yeah, and there's a cut of the film that uh, Kevin Smith has um, that's like a director's cut that's like a darker vision that was intended to be what the movie would be. So like Schumacher actually wanted to make a genuine film with that. And then Batman and Robin, it was just like the studio con job. But anyway, if Batman and Robin had not bombed, they were going to make a fifth Batman film okay. uh, with George Clooney called Batman Triumphant. And they were going to resurrect Jack Nicholson's Joker, who dies in the 1989 Batman. Um, and they were going to bring in Harley Quinn. And there was speculation. I don't know if it's true or not, but there was speculation that Courtney Love was going to be, be playing Harley Quinn, which I think would have been fucking perfect. See, now, hearing all of that, I'm like, okay, I've heard Batman Triumphant before. That makes sense now. And going off of the Joker 2, Fudu Fa Fa, whatever the fuck, Flay the Concours reference, like, yeah, I can understand that being the basis, because what we talked about was that it's going to be Joaquin Phoenix, Arthur, Joker, kind of marinating in the successes of becoming this overnight sensation for murder and that maybe he's going to have struggles with addiction, drinking pills, kind of bring in that river Phoenix metaphor with his brother and with Courtney love being the basis for what they're going for. And I don't doubt you Declan, because we have a, a sixth sense with this Shyamalanian film trivia bullshit. Uh, I think you're right. She's going to have to get abused and used and go from the apple of Mr. J's eye to the spilled cup of coffee in the morning that he pisses on. And the only thing I have to say going off of all of this is that you don't like – you don't dislike Joker. The whole thing that we realize is that you dis, you say you dislike Joker because you are Joker. 
It's a film that speaks tremendous volumes. What volumes does it speak, man? Hey, man. I don't know. I don't know. Let me because ask the this. The scene where oh. he shoots Murray Franklin is fucking god awful. No, it's, it's like, not. It's a, yes, it is. It's a scene that everybody talks about as being like the the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, like what won him the Oscar. And I'm like, this is what won him the Oscar. It was dialogue that was written by an eight year old. Okay. What do you get when first you cross? Off. First off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shakespeare and Love won Best Picture. That's all I'm gonna say off of that tangent. Joker, dude, it's a movie that, sure, the dialogue might be all over the place, but it's at, the, at its core, it's a superhero film. And that part, when it gets to the theater, you can't tell me. I've never seen anyone within the complex of talking about this film that was like, yeah, no, I was with him that time. Like, when he's saying all that stuff, despite how you feel the mental illness and maybe he's off the rails, he's not treating people properly, you want him to shoot Travis Bickle in the head. I that's what I felt watching that movie. All right. I just think mm-hmm. he wouldn't he wouldn't deliver. Okay, this is what pissed me off. He says they're like uh, Robert De Niro's like okay, so you're crazy. That's your excuse for killing those two men on the subway. And he goes, no, they couldn't sing a tune to save their lives. And he's making a joke out of it, which is great. But why didn't he actually indict those kids by saying what they actually did? That they were horrible pricks who were trying to basically assault a woman on a subway train. Because that would have kind of exonerated him in a way. And it would have been a, a, it would have been a statement. It would have been political. I guess that's not what he was going for. But like he could have actually, I don't know, said something about... Like, oh, yeah, they were they were awful pricks, and they tried to rape a woman on the subway. You know, but he doesn't do that. He just says, I killed them because they were awful. Everyone is awful these days. It's enough to make anyone crazy. You know, like, fuck you. What a yeah, wasted, but, what a wasted but, moment. But character-wise, you're telling me Arthur Fleck is going to be the voice of the post-Me Too movement, feminism? The guy finally gets onto the TV program he's wanted to in his his entire life. It's it's the Johnny Carson parallel, even with the curtains looking like his, his set in the, the the original show. He he doesn't have the coherency to start talking about women. The man he barely doesn't have has the coherency a relationship to do with anything, his mother. And that's what sucks about it. But that's He's not, not true. a funny comedian. That's not true. Because as we said, in comedic terms, in our demo, he literally kills. Where he tells these jokes in front of people, he doesn't get a lot of laughs. The joke is that this man goes on the Murray Franklin show, kills literally, the whole audience gets the hell out of there, and then he's like, and that's lo-. and then they cut to the thing, they do the network reference panning back of watching all the news people take off about it, and that's the whole thing. It's it's not like, wait, are you saying that like you, you would have wished that there was a more adult moment in this R-rated superhero film where Joker, a man that's known for a purple suit, being the shit out of the only woman that loved him, he just starts going, and you know what, Murray? Jennifer Lawrence's nudes should not have been leaked. Those men on the train far, saw those it. nudes, and they probably laughed about her butthole. But there's nothing funny about her butthole, oh, Murray. <laughs> Uh, She's going to have a big-time comeback. That's that's one thing I wanted to ask because a lot of people on the old uh, fortune.com are saying that this movie that she's in is good. How, have you seen it yet, being an AMC um, theater man? I haven't seen the whole movie. I've seen parts of the movie, and I've seen the ending of the movie uh, from cleaning it at the end of you know the night. Um, and, uh, yeah, the stuff I saw was good. I, I nice. wasn't raving about it, but I thought it was – I mean, the one word I can say about it is it was cute. It was cute. I like Jennifer Lawrence. I thought the Neat kid too. who plays the, um, the the shy, awkward teenager did a great job. He was He's a, a very, like, physically versatile actor where um, his mannerisms are very, like, stiff and kind of, like, aloof and awkward, and I thought that worked really well. Yeah. Um, but, like, do I have the motivation to see it in theaters? I get to see movies for free, and even I don't. I'm not 
that interested. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. The other thing, it already it's already exceeded the expectations they thought at the box here. office. The reason I bring it up is because it's doing better than the Flash right now. More people anything are anything is doing dope. better than the Flash. Anything. Well, yeah, and good because that movie was terrible. Yes, it was, exactly. It was god awful. But does from what you've seen in these cute clips, does it redeem Jennifer Lawrence and uh, your least favorite director? Which maybe that'd be good for clearing up the end of this demo. Um, what's his David O. Russell's piece of shit that is the film Joy? Which by the end of it, I li- I, li- I turned to my mother after we watched it, and I was like, "The fuck is this bullshit?" And she was like, "I have no idea, well, my wig." This is, and this, took is a one, this is the one time where I'll galvanize Joker, as far okay. as uh, um, not appropriating mental illness, but doing a uh, a good job of conveying the um, the reality of mental illness. Is that Joker did a much better job? than one of my most hated films of all time. And it's the complete antithesis in dealing with um, uh, mental illness to the movie that we're going to be talking about in tandem with Last Tango in Paris for our official podcast, A Woman Under the Influence. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, uh, Silver Linings Playbook. Uh, I'm bipolar and I fucking can't stand that movie. I hate it. I, I hate that movie. Oh, you are? Oh, wow. Okay. What's going on? What's she saying? She said she's bipolar, too. Ask her her thoughts on the film Silver Linings Playbook. What are, what are your thoughts on the film Silver Linings Playbook? I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it? Don't. Okay. Don't ask her now. Ask her her name and ask her what her fav- a, a good film that portrays mental illness. Uh, what's your name and what's a good film that oh, portrays mental it. illness? Oh, he watched it? Yeah. What do you think? Good movie. It's well made. Okay. Uh, uh, whatever emotions come up, it's a response. Uh-huh. What's his okay. name? It can be triggering. It can be triggering. Okay. That's what he said. I'm going to leave him alone now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> Declan, dude, well done. I like – just keep you on the street, man. This is good. I love that shit. Oh. Uh. I'm going to oh, leave man. them alone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So then mental illness and all that stuff. I agree. The difference is, is I like Silver Linings Playbook because to me it at least showed that Bradley Cooper was capable of acting, which is a thing I struggle with. Except there's this other film, which you and I will end it here. American Hustle to me is a 10 out of 10, 5 out of 5, perfect film in the sense that where Joker is a meme movie masquerading as a serious superhero picture, it's actually a critique of film with fourth wall breaking narratives as well as mental illness relating to the Dark Knight Rises shooting. And we got Arthur Fleck shooting up Murray. American Hustle does the same thing for filmmaking. It's a movie completely made for award season and where I hate critics. I love my father, but I hate critics. It's, to me... A very, very good movie. Now, Declan, what do you think about David O. Russell? And what do you think about David O. Russell's American Hustle? Uh, I'm getting tired of David O. Russell and his piece of shit films like American Hustle. Mm -hmm. There's my Mm -hmm. early holiday jingle for the year. I liked it. Um, He he did a movie with uh, my friend. I'll keep him anonymous because he wants to remain anonymous for whatever reason. But he was telling me... um, He was telling me... um, (laughs) He showed me a video of it's uh, Dustin Hoffman in a car acting opposite two women for some movie that David O. Russell was making. I don't know the name of the movie, and I don't care. But um, they had to feed the actors their lines because they're giving this, like, 30-minute long monologue, and they're shooting in one take, and one of the women is, like, saying, like, this is impossible. I can't do this. You need to give us more time. You need, need to give us more um, freedom as actors to be able to, to pull this off. And uh, like 10 or 15 minutes into this one shot take of two, three fuckers in a car, uh, David O. Russell just turns to the woman and calls her a cunt to her face. And, that seems uh, about right. And I, well, you, you have a story about David O. Russell because you <laughs> fucking met the guy and he was, he was an <laughs> asshole to you. I was, uh, he's an yeah. asshole. He bullies okay. his actors. 
Okay. And he's not yeah. a good director. And his I movies would, suck. Okay. I disagree with he's not a good director. He's a good director. He's a horrible person. And with that in mind, okay? Thank you, Declan, for now I get to do my cool thing. You got to talk to that lovely couple on the street. Okay, so the year, folks, is 2013, 2012, all right? The movie that's released is American Hustle. My father is a film critic. He gets invited to go to the awards. He's like, hey, I'm going to bring along my brilliant genius son who is going to transcend cinema forever. Why not? Might be a good idea for him. He didn't know that me and Declan would be working together in the future. But I go to the awards show. I'm meeting all types of people. I'm meeting a guy who, you know, he's at this time like, oh, Jay Leno is replacing uh, Conan? Good. And I'm arguing with this old fucker, and I, I wish I could scalp him in Glorious Bastard style. I didn't do that. So, you know, mingling, learning that there are other critics, some have good taste, some don't. Another story that I'll tell on this podcast is I was mistaken for one of the actors in War Horse, and I was treated to, like, luxury prefix stuff that none of the critics got, but that's the story of another time. So during the commercial breaks of the awards show, you know, critics go up, they go up to the actors, they bother them. That same night, my dad bothered Emma Thompson, bothered Meryl Streep, you know, and then I, sh- I come up behind them, and I'm like, you know, he just, he really loves you. I'm, I'm so sorry about this. And then, like, they laugh. And then the other famous thing, Allison Janney, uh, in the year, I think The Help was nominated, I believe she's in that movie, remembers my dad as the guy with the orange tie, because my dad always wears this orange tie. So there are people that are nice, and they have souls, and Allison Janney is definitely one of them. However, David O. Russell. In the middle of one of the commercial breaks, we're walking around, you know, everyone's going over to Bradley Cooper. The women are salivating. They're dripping. It's disgusting. I go over to David O. Russell. My dad is like, hey, I loved American Hustle. David Russell's like, okay, thank you very much. Whatever. He's there with his wife or companion cohort hooker. I don't give a fuck. The man's garbage. And essentially, my dad says, well, my son wants to be a filmmaker Sunday, someday. My son wants to be a filmmaker Sunday. Uh, Okay, we're going to edit this one more time, and you can use this clip. Hey, David, my son wants to be a filmmaker someday. Is there any advice that you could give to him about, you know, being a filmmaker before my, you know, my dad walks off? David O'Russell says, I don't know, be a filmmaker. Why the fuck would you want to be that? You should be a fucking dentist. Because at the time, I didn't have the best teeth. However... With the liquor in me looking into stuff years later, David O. Russell comes from a family of dentists. So he was actually speaking about it himself, the incredulous, self indictedly fucking moronic piece of twerp garbage that he is. And, uh, yeah, so I was left next to David O. Russell, who was, like, vehemently looking at all the attention Bradley Cooper's getting and wishing that he looked like him. And so I was just kind of standing there, like, so how... Was it fun working with Louis C.K.? And then getting like the most shitty trite answers of three to five words, and I finally walked away. And, you know, I ended up talking with Cuba Gooding Jr., who was stoned off his ass of like margaritas and martinis, and was a nice guy. But, like, yeah, dude, David O. Russell's a piece of shit. I just still love the movie American Hustle because it, it you know, sound and color. Um, visual and audio, that's all filmmaking is. And when it's done really, really well, you know, Christian Bale's performance in that, great. Amy Adams, she's my favorite actress of this current day and age. I met her, I believe, that same night. Yes, it was. I put my arm around Lois Lane, and she was so sweet, and, like, we got to talk for three minutes, and she wasn't a cunt, like unlike David O. Russell which they have their own beef because he was like, show your tits. And she's like, I feel uncomfortable, rightfully so. Uh, maybe maybe Joker should have shot David O. Russell in the face. But um, my main thing is that David O. Russell is horrible, but American Hustle is a terrific film. Yeah, all right. That's my anecdote there. But uh, yeah, yeah, man, that happened. It's a pretty fun time. Pretty good, pretty good time. They had mini cheeseburger things as appetizers that were delicious. Probably harvested from the souls of children in the Clinton Foundation. But hey, they tasted all right. Not too bad. <laughs> Oprah was there. I got a picture of Oprah where her head is so fucking massive. 
It's the size of my television, and I think to myself every time I look at it, Roger Ebert fucked that head. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, I'll tell other stories another time on the podcast, but what is it about the movie American Hustle you didn't like, regardless of I David O'Rourke's? it was boring. It was, really, it was a really boring movie where everyone was overacting. Everybody yes, was it, going yes. for the fucking Oscar, and I hated yes. it. Yes, no, but that's that's a good critique. Especially, that's why especially I like Christian Bale. I didn't like him in the in the movie. I don't care about his like weird body transformations. I I don't give a shit. He, I didn't like him in the movie. I didn't even. I love Amy Adams, but I didn't like her in the movie either. I didn't like anybody in that movie. I thought it was really boring and pretentious. Just like, just like um, not American Hustle. Just like Silver Linings Playbook. Um. Just like I don't, I don't know. Like I don't like any of his movies. I just don't. I don't like the fighter. Oh, the fighter's a piece of shit, dude. The fighter is my akin to what you're saying about American Hustle. I couldn't make it through that movie. And yo, body transformations aside, like that's not why I like Bale's performance in American Hustle. But uh, no, I know. Yeah, no, you're right though. The pretentiousness. It's it's American Hustle is a very pretentious movie. It's quite literally made for award season. It's to trick the critics into thinking that this is some amazing movie when really it's a bunch of hodgepodge stuff. But I like it. Well, you called you, Harrison did a poem uh, about like an ex girlfriend or whatever, and he said he was hmm. there was one bit that made me laugh until I had tears coming out of my eyes, which was uh, I I won't watch Titanic because it's just a movie about a bunch of rich fuckers on a boat and I it is having just seen Titanic <laughs> for the first time in 4K 3D I was like right on brother like oh my god I know I know I gotta see it eventually I know this and a lot of my friends you know even boys are like no it's a good movie but uh it's, it's, yeah it is. it's a good movie it's Titanic you know like I'll watch it. So what you're saying is you think those people in the submersible deserve to suffer. Oh, are we going full-fledged unfiltered here? Sure, why not? Fuck yeah, they did, dude. It's a submarine that they thought a guy with a video game controller, that that was a good idea? No, I don't feel anything for those people. I feel something for the TV movie, American Horror Story movie that will be made about them and they'll add gay commentary. But no, I don't, I really don't care. They did it to themselves, man. <laughs> you hear that, government agents? That's what I think about that. That's what I think about that. Okay? Okay. Well, I'm yeah. Declan Powers. He's Harrison Giza. Thank you and good night. This has been a tour aristocrat. We're listening to Connecticut Public Public Radio. David O. Russell is a disgusting cunt. Good night.